You know, you mentioned uh, the five factors, and I think you've told us three of them. I'm wondering what the other two are. So finding a guide or a mentor, recognizing and replacing the lost values, um, learning uh, group involvement, um, increasing authenticity and truth seeking, and finally, well, I, I've already talked about the, the fifth one, learning new instrumental and coping skills. The, uh -huh. the, the bulk of the work that's done with cognitive processing therapy or stress inoculation training or um, uh, even uh, some of the exposure treatments, uh, you know, eye movement desensitization and things like that. They, yeah. people need to learn microscopic skills of how to keep their, their breathing. Uh, there, there's a lot of reference in the book that the doctor trains the people to recognize each other's tension and, and breathing disruptions and to remind them to, hey, Jake, breathe, take a breath. And so when somebody says, when somebody uh, does that, the group often will say, good sigh. <laughs> yeah, good, good. I was impressed too that you've got a section on evidence-based therapy. And uh, for a guy who was in the trenches for so long, they didn't talk about evidence-based until fairly recently. Um, and I've been impressed by the therapists that I talked to. I, I was, I heard the word, the term evidence-based. And I thought, you know, the APA was pushing it. And I thought, well, that's kind of an easy thing to give lip service to. But I wonder how many clinicians are really going to jump on board with that idea. I've been surprised in the interviews that I've been doing that it seems like clinicians really have taken that to heart. And, you know, you're a senior guy and uh, you're talking about the importance of evidence base, too. Yes, and I, I think that there's um, more and more data, very good studies with serious clinical populations, especially within the VA system. I mentioned Patty Resick before. Um, they have done decades of double blind, fully controlled treatment programs demonstrating that this particular part of cognitive processing or that particular part of um, uh, stress inoculation is necessary or enhances the treatment outcome this number of percent. So those data are very impressive. And not only are they very impressive, they are being put into a, um, a form this is why you got this award, by the way, from the APA, I think. You give psychology away very well. Remember George Albee said that years and years ago? Um, and what they're doing with these evidence-based treatment studies is they're now dispensing them on the internet. So you, if you are a person with post-traumatic stress disorder, then you can literally go onto the internet and get cognitive processing therapy that delivered to you in the comfort of your home. Yeah, yeah, more and more things like that. Well, you know, we're probably getting at a place where it's about time to start wrapping it up. And I wonder if there's anything that you had hoped to be able to express here that you haven't had a chance to do, or, or just some kind of final wrap-up statement that you'd like to make. Well, uh, yes, I, I wanted to focus on or emphasize, just like we were talking about, the evidence-based treatments tell us what to do, but the therapist, the compassionate therapist, does it at the right time and in the right manner so that it has maximum impact. And what are the features of a good therapist? How does one pick a good therapist? How does one find a guide or a mentor that fits for you. And yeah, you, of, have a, you have a, a, an appendix in the book yes, about I do. that. I, yeah. I, I'm really pleased with that section too, because it describes um, 
using the technology that um, Truex and Kharkov developed years and years oh, ago. Yeah, yeah. And identified what are the skills of the good of a effective therapist. So, excuse me. Um, I boil it down to an alliteration. A therapist needs to be truthful, uh, tender, tolerant, and every once in a while tough. 